Hello interwebs, welcome to Let's Fix Computers. MacBook Air, no power, let's go. So, I'm gonna plug in the charger. We have a green light on the charger, which is turned orange for charging. Does it turn on? That looks like a no. Sometimes MacBook Airs take a while to turn on, so I'm going to waffle for a bit to buy some time, like this. It doesn't turn on. Okay, fine. Let's see if we can figure out why it does not turn on. So let's start by taking the bottom panel off. Le fluff. Okay, so lots of fluff. Uh, that's okay, fluff is normal. Tide marks that indicate liquid damage, apart from my thumbprint there. There's a lot of dust in this thing. That's, to be honest, the biggest indicator. There's no tide marks, so I'm not expecting to see any liquid damage in this. Although just because there's no tide marks doesn't mean there's nothing to find on that front. Um, let's disconnect the battery and just see if it starts with the battery disconnected. So this serves two purposes. The amount of time it takes me to disconnect the battery, waffle to the camera a bit, and then plug in the charger is probably about enough time to do an SMC reset. So we're gonna reset the system management controller, which might make it come good. So plug in the charger. And that looks like it's gonna do nothing. So let's measure our main rails. So a MacBook Air has two main power rails in that are absolutely required to make it turn on and work. Uh, the first one is PP3V42, which as the name suggests is 3.42 volts, and that powers the SMC um, among some other things, but mainly the SMC. Um, so that is powered directly from the battery or from the charger. Now, because we have an orange light on the charger, this tells me that this rail is already up. However, let's measure it for good measure. Um, so I'll put my black probe on ground, and um, there's actually uh, a spot down here on the SMC reset area where I can measure it. We can look this up on schematics. However, it's going to be there, so I won't bother spending too much time on this. So let's have a look at that. Right. 3.43, that's good enough. So PP3V42 is present. Now for the infamous PPBus G3 Hot. PPBus G3 Hot is the main power rail in the laptop and it powers everything else. All the other power rails are derided from PPBus G3 Hot, which on a MacBook will be about eight and a half volts. We're expecting it to be 8.6. Um, so this is also powered from the battery or from the charger. Um, and the output for it is this big inductor here. So what I'm gonna do is directly below that is a fuse. So I shall focus the camera. So let's measure the output side of that fuse. And we've got 8.6 volts near enough. Uh, good, okay, so the S, so PP bus G3 hot is up. And because it's at 8.6 volts, we know that the SMC is running. If it was low, like 8.4 volts, that tells me that the SMC is not running because the SMC will just bump the voltage up ever so slightly on PP bus G3 hot, which is how you know if the SMC is on or not, basically. Um, very well. Okay, so our two main power rails are present. So something else is preventing this laptop from turning on. So what I'm going to do now then is I'm going to take the logic board out of the laptop um, so we can get a look at both sides of it uh, because this is likely to be a more complicated one, potentially anyway. So uh, I'll start. Battery is already disconnected. I'll disconnect the, the uh, screen and then we'll unplug the antennas for the Wi-Fi card, the, back, the keyboard backlight and the keyboard, the ribbon connector to the I.O. board, or the DC board, uh, power from the DC board, the webcam, 
and that'll do me. And now I've got to take out the screws on the logic board to actually take the logic board out. So let's get those guys out. Right, that's our logic board. There we go. Remember how I said that it could still be liquid damage? There's our guy. Interesting. Right, so before we do anything else, let's just take a quick look at what that is. So, can I wipe that without removing it entirely? Not super yet. I want to see what that is before I actually clear it off. So that Windbond chip, that's the UEFI um, chip. So that's our BIOS chip. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to open up the schematics for this and let's take a look at what those circuits there are doing because that will give me an idea on if this is likely to be the cause of the fault or not. Is that a critical spot is the question. So this board is a 00165. 8200165. And if I switch over to the board view and schematics in Flex Board View, uh, let's see. That is the chip. So that is the U6100. And all of our schmutz is here on this spot here. Let's compare that again. Yeah, so we've got the U1900 next to it. What is U1900? Uh, oh yeah, that's the system clock chip. That is very important. So what are these resistors here? These are the guys that are right in the firing line. So this is an SPI line. SPI, SPI, SPI. So these are the SPI bus. And we'll probably find that these connect to the BIOS chip. Where are these going? There we go. These guys connect through to all the stuff that's adjacent in this area, which is system clock and BIOS related. And they also go through to the other side of the board, I believe. I think these are going through. And if we move up, they also join through to the JTAG connector on the other side of the board. And the JTAG connector also has some very important signals on it, which we saw in a very recent video. Um, so once again, this is a critical spot on the board that is very, very exposed at the edge of the logic board. This is um, the MacBook Air and a lot of MacBooks are notorious for having very important stuff in very exposed locations. So um, cool. Well, let's clean this up and let's just see if that's enough to make it come good, first of all. OK, I'm going to use a paintbrush and just brush the dust away. If you are in a high static area, you should probably not use a paintbrush. Um, I do actually have a nice big ultrasonic cleaner now, which would be perfect for this. Um, but I don't, it's a bit overkill for this. If I found a lot of liquid damage here, I'd probably lob this in my ultrasonic cleaner. However, for now, we're going to keep things simple because um, uh, when possible, I like to use simple tools, stuff that you guys might have at home kind of thing, or stuff that people who are just starting out will actually be able to get hold of. Because I appreciate the fact that it's very easy for me to go, look, now I'll put it in my big fancy ultrasonic cleaner. But if you don't have an ultrasonic cleaner, then that kind of sucks. So uh, let's grab my isopropyl alcohol, give that a squirt. Uh, I'm just going to give that some brushy brushy with a toothbrush. Right, that looks pretty sketchy still. Let's get the big close up on that and see what's going on down there. Oh, those uh, those resistors still look pretty angry, don't they? Okay, uh, right. So isopropyl alcohol is very good because it's quite gentle, but it's not actually very good at cleaning. So to deal with this, I'm going to go in with some window and glass cleaner. Now, this is a bit of a mad lad option, but I find that window and glass is a, it's that little bit more aggressive and it will actually clean things a bit more effectively. So 
I used to use this on the whole board. I tend not to do that these days, not because I had problems with it, but just because alcohol is safer because it's non-conductive. But the fun thing is, because this is made with like deionized water and stuff like that, um, this stuff is also very non-conductive. It just takes longer to evaporate, which means you need to be a bit more careful about whether it's under chips or not and things like that. So I'm going to squirt a little bit of that on there. So I've just put a little bit of that there, and let's now scrub that clean. That's a bit more than I intended to use. So time for more brushy brushy. Yeah, so we still haven't really managed to bring that up, and we've actually lost a resistor there. So this is the drawback of using the brushy brushy method, is that you might knock things off. Now, my opinion of this is that uh, if you're able to knock it off with a toothbrush, then it wasn't on properly in the first place. However, there's always a possibility that if you knock something off with a toothbrush, you'll damage the pads. So this is the uh, this is one of the reasons why the brushy method is pro uh, may not always be the best, is that you might do further damage to it. Whereas what I could have done is immediately go in with um, flux and hot air to reflow this area. However, in this in this case, I think we're doing okay. That doesn't look like serious damage to me, but we are actually going to need to do soldering work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the hot air on and I'm going to remove um, all four of those resistors in that square there. So where's my tweezers? So we're going to take out um, we're going to take out one, two, three, four, and I'm going to clean up all of those pads, retin them with solder and put down some new resistors. Those uh, those first two, these two are probably okay to be honest. These guys, I'm gonna get rid of those because they're obviously causing problems. So uh, let's take those off the board and then uh, we'll look up what they are and I will grab some spares. So these are very small resistors but I have donor boards that I will steal them from. So let's get started. Add some flux, and we're going to come in with the hot air, 450 degrees, about 50% airflow. And I'm just going to warm the area up. Move that hair out the way because that's going to smell. And I'm going to get my super duper tweezers out for this one because that's really heckin' small. Right, that's the resistor off. Now we'll come in with the soldering iron and some fresh solder, and that should reflow and that should clear up this area. Right, I'm making a hash of this. This is not a great example, so I'm going to change my tactics a little bit. I'm going to reorientate the board so I've got better access because I was working over the board. And we're just going to come in again and just put this to rise. So this other re resistor is loose. That one will come good with some hot air, but I'm really worried about those pads. So I'm going to chop out to a small soldering iron and actually get this under control. There's no other way to put it here. The toothbrush method is working against me here. Um, it's not. It's actually making things worse. Um, so I use the toothbrush method because I've had plenty of luck with it in the past. However, in this in this instance, it's very much making things worse. So let's stop with that, and let's go ahead and get in uh, a small soldering iron tip and just bring those pads up. Come. 
I'm having that problem where the solder wants to go everywhere except the very tip of the iron, which I think is a sign that my tip is knackered. Let's get flux in there. All right, nice big solder blob. Of course, all of the solder is going up the sides of the iron and not onto the tip. Right, so we've lost a pad on one of the uh, resistors. That's not a big deal though, because I'm not, it looks like those two resistors are common together. And we can confirm this in the board view. Let's turn that board around and we should find these two connect together. Yes, they do. So that's no problem at all. Good, okay. Right, well, we've cleaned all the schmutz off, so let's put some new resistors down, and that should all be okay. We're working pretty small by my standards here, which is making things tricky. Now, what resistors are these? These are R6125 and R6120. And these are all 43 ohm resistors. So, very common, lots of these all across the board. Easy enough to put these back in. Good, so I'm going to steal a couple of spares from a donor board. Despite being really small, these resistors I find very, very challenging to work on. They seem to take a lot of heat to get off the board. My flux is already burnt away. There's one. And there's the other. Oh, did I just blow that one away? Gosh, heck it. Okay. Moving resistors around is uh, very basic looking, especially for people who are already uh, who already know their board repair stuff. However, just for those of you who uh, um, have only ever watched this on a video and never actually looked at this IRL, bearing in mind, that's my little finger. These things are really small. That's my excuse for being bad. I get very nervous working on the super small stuff like this. Okay, right, I'm content that those are in position. I don't have a lot of faith in the joins. Um, so I'm just gonna let that dry. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the soldering iron to just solder blob the ends of those two together because there's no pad under that one. And then I'll just try and reflow the end of that guy to make sure he's sticking down to his pad. And that should be okay. So let's turn the board around. I'm gonna make the board work for me by turning it around so my hand has got plenty of room to work with. And now I'm just gonna reflow. Oh, there we go, he's not on, I knew it. Shit. Okay. Let's put a bit of solder on the end of the iron and hope that's on. This bit is my nightmare. Oh, that's way too much solder. Oh, go away, phone. Now's not a good time. Adam and IT. Shit. 
Right, okay, we'll need to hot air this back on. Let's just see if I can get some solder onto that pad so it sticks down this time. Oh, I've got all the solder in the world on that test point, but not on the pad that I'm aiming for. Oh my god. This is the BC2 tip, and as I say, I don't know if I'm doing something wrong or whether my or whether the or the, the tip is just knackered, but man, I can never get solder to stay on the right side of this tip. It's very frustrating. Come on. This is also the time where the solder I'm using is just simply too big. I think that's the other problem. Oh my god, are you seeing this? It wants to go everywhere except the pad I need it to be on. My god. What about this one? Can you believe this? How is there no solder going onto that pad? Okay, right, well, I'm not very thrilled with how that went down. Um, I was fighting the soldering iron every step of the way, and I'm not sure if that's because my BC2 tip is knackered, or just isn't very good, or maybe just simply that I'm using solder that is too thick. I'm definitely using solder that is too thick. I've got some thinner stuff, I just don't have it on the bench, and I need to just bite the bullet and be like, get the thin solder out. Stop being a hero and using the same solder for everything. Um, but what I... So I could not get solder to adhere to that pad there. Even though it's come up shiny, I could just not get any solder onto it. Um, so in the end, what I did was I bridged the resistor from that test pad down to here. Now, these two are supposed to join up anyway. They both go to the same line. Then this test pad joins to that pad there. Uh, and we can confirm this on the board view over here. So that is what it's supposed to look like. This pad is not working. This pad is gone. So what I did was I joined this resistor from here down to here, which is functionally identical. Because as you can see, these two are connected. There's The line goes to the same place. And this pad connects up to this test point. So instead, I've just jumped across there to the two pads that I could get the, the um, uh, resistor onto. So, although that is a really sketchy repair, it is electrically correct. So, we should find that the laptop works now. And definitely the takeaway, the moral of this story is just, again, I need more practice with the super small stuff. We are down to the really, really small sizes here. I'm upset. This one was supposed to be straightforward. It should have been easy. But that's the way videos work, man. Um, certainly for the format that I'm trying to do. You know, I start the video going, this is going to be a tutorial style video. And in the end, it turns into a video like this where I'm riding by the seat of my pants. And But that's how it goes when you're learning this stuff. Is Sometimes you will just find that it is not going to plan. Um, let's see, I'm just going to clean up that little bit because if I clean that up and this all works, we're ready to reassemble. Right, we're going to do the super rough fit. Um, I want the screen. I want the speakers so I can hear if it chimes. I want power. 
and I want a loose screw to stop the board falling out. There we go. And that is enough for me to turn this on and see if it powers up. Come on, repair gods. I'd appreciate a win today. Right, we've got no green light on the charger because I forgot to connect that bridge up. However, we do have fan spin. The screen has come on. And we should get a blinking um, a blinking question mark folder. I think we are WinRa. Show me the question mark folder, which will take a moment to come up. Happy days. All right. Okay, let's reassemble properly. Okay, so uh, my thoughts on all of that. Um, I made a bit of a hash up of this one, uh, not because I misdiagnosed it or anything, but just because I was right on the limits of my soldering skill there. Um, and that was a mixture of um, just technique. Um, working on stuff that small uh, is a lot harder than it looks. And I do commend anyone who is actually able to do that consistently. Um, a lot of folks who have only ever watched video, like I've watched lots of videos on board repair, and when watching other people working on this kind of thing, um, when you're watching their their microscope camera, everything looks enormous, and you think, oh, it's easy. Just press the soldering iron to the side of the, um, uh, just press the soldering iron to the side of the resistor. But when you're actually working on resistors that small for real, where you more or less can't see them unless they're under the camera or the microscope, um, it's a lot harder than it looks, quite frankly. Um, the other issue is I definitely seem to be fighting my equipment there. And that is a sign that there is a problem with my equipment. Um, now, that was partially because the soldering, the solder that I use is very big and thick. Uh, and I do actually have thinner solder and I need to start using it. I've been very stubborn and been like, oh, my solder spool is perfectly fine. And it's like, no, I need to use thinner solder um, for, type, for cases like that. I also have suspicion that my BC2 tip, which is the soldering iron tip I was using there, is buggered. Because as you can see, it just didn't want to take solder on the actual tip, only on the sides. And I don't know if that was an issue with my technique or the solder, or whether that's a sign that the tip is just knackered. Either way, there was clearly an issue with the tip there. Um, but nonetheless, uh, I did actually manage to get everything on there, and I managed to do it in a way that worked. Not necessarily the most elegant solution, but a functional solution. So, make of that what you will. And past that, I hope you guys found that interesting and or informative. And I will see you guys in the next video soon. Um, support links are down below. Patreon, Discord, Twitter, Instagram, yada, yada, yada. And uh, thanks for watching. Bye, everyone.